okay, I think it's almost time to get started. Um, one thing that I wanted to tell you guys about is that I think I'm going to start recording the lectures and then posting them on my YouTube channel so that you can watch them more easily. Um, last semester I had to start a YouTube channel because we switched to online classes in the middle, as you may recall. Uh, and I think yesterday there were some problems with entering the password. Um, so hopefully this will be easier. So I'll send you an email about it. You guys don't necessarily need to know that unless you're going to watch later. So uh, before we get started, does anybody have any questions about anything? Everybody doing okay? Reasonably okay? Okay. Um, what we're going to do today is talk about the Patriot. Uh, so hopefully you guys have had a chance to watch it already. Um, for some of you, I got the impression that you had seen it a lot of times, uh, which is kind of interesting. Some of you talked in your paper about uh, having seen it in school and having seen it like at home with your families and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm very excited to hear uh, more of your thoughts tomorrow. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen so that we can see the slideshow. All right. So um, there's just so much. So much to talk about with the Patriot, um, and I'm I'm really interested in this movie. I think as a as a moment in American cinema history. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today are the people on whom the characters were based, um, and specifically the historical perspective um, of why we made a movie like this and why it became sort of our, our lasting impression of the war. So first, um, as always, one of the things I like to do is talk about the moment in history at which the thing was created and and by whom. So. Um, the Patriot was released in 2000, so it's 20 years old, which does seem kind of surprising already. Um, and it's an especially unusual movie because it was made by a German director, uh, and it stars two Australians, um, and it's somehow about America. And yet also, perhaps it's not about America at all. So they shot it on location in South Carolina, uh, which is pretty cool. Over here on the left, it's um, one of the sets from the movie, and they built that. I, I, when you look at the set, it really does look like they found some like scenic ruins. Uh, they said it was a Spanish mission, but they just built that, and then they left it there. You can go visit it if you want. Um, in like retrospect, it is generally considered probably one of the worst war movies of all time. And there are these like entire uh, YouTube, you know, clip shows that you can go back and watch that explain how, how inaccurate it is. Um, but it is also extremely popular. So it grossed about, what, 250 million uh, worldwide. So it's not just an American movie. People have watched it from all over the place. So it's, it's sort of one in a series of war movies that Mel Gibson made. Uh, that was like his jam for a minute there. You've probably seen Braveheart. Braveheart. Um, and so it like sort of has a very distinct place in history in that regard. Uh, number one, it's meant to be a representation of one of our most important historical moments. Um, and number two, popular movies just have a lot of power. Uh, people tend to, to see popular movies more than they would see like, you know, a documentary or something like that. Um, and also it has a place in classrooms because it's extremely violent, but otherwise relatively PG. And Americans, of course, don't consider violence to be a, a problem for children. Sex a problem, but not violence, of course. Um, so it's, it's really had a major place in history. So that's one of the reasons I'm excited to talk about it. So a massive, hit, basically, uh, but it had different sort of reception between the critics and the audience. So let's talk about that for a second. So in regard to critical reception, um, it wasn't particularly popular. It wasn't hugely panned, like it's not one of those movies with like a negative score on Rotten Tomatoes or anything, um, but most critics tended to give it about a 3.5 uh, out of 5 stars. It ended up with, you know, like maybe a 60% or so. Um, the one notable exception was that John Williams got an Oscar for the score. John Williams is, of course, a genius, uh, and it was a good score. And I think that the cinematography was also nominated for an Oscar. So it wasn't hugely panned in that regard. Um, looking back, a lot of people are mad at it, but at the time, people were basically like, yeah, you know, it's a popcorn movie. Um, the audience, on the other hand, loved it. Uh, they were super into it. Um, it was like a, a big summer blockbuster type of movie. Uh, it was the kind of movie that like really struck a chord with a certain, you know, like young male audience who likes a lot of violence. Like it, it was a big hit in that regard. So 
if you look at the critical reviews, it got, you know, like a 61% or so, but if you look at the audience reviews, it's much more in the 90s. So there's always kind of a, a distinction between what the critics think and what the audience thinks. And depending on who you're making the movie for, that can really impact what you decide, you know? So the Americans, uh, largely viewed as patriotic, is one of those movies that comes on uh, cable on like July 4th weekend. Uh, the British found it to be libelous. They were pissed, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it was necessary, of course, to have a villain, and the villain was the British Army, and specifically that one general, right? Um, so when it did come out, um, a lot of the British critics were pissed, um, especially about the inaccurate representation uh, of Charlton, which we'll talk about. Um, so it was, it was really kind of mixed in that regard, but there's one interesting twist. It's possible that the audience didn't like it that much at all, um, so after the movie came out, it was found that Sony was messing with audience reviews. So for one thing, they were uh, paying people to pretend to be audience members and then to do interviews afterwards to talk about how much they liked it. So essentially, Sony employees uh, would pretend, um, you've probably seen these interviews when people come out of the theater and they're all like, that's the best movie ever. Like Sony was paying people to do that. But also, uh, they just invented a film critic. So they invented this film critic from scratch, and he reviewed more than one movie, but specifically he reviewed this movie, and he said he really liked it, and it was the greatest movie of all time, et cetera, et cetera. But then when they tried to track him down, they went to the newspaper that he said that he was from, and that newspaper consisted of only two movie critics, a father and a son, and they had never heard of this guy. So the more they dug into it, the more they found out that this guy not only didn't exist, but he didn't work for that newspaper, um, and he was... Um, sort of like a nom de plume that several different men used to write movie reviews that were fake. So it was a whole big scandal. So it was kind of an interesting moment in like film review history because it was one of the first like uncovered, uh, you know, scams that people had been taking part in. And after it turned out that a lot of the reviews were fake, um, Sony did sign a deal that they were going to um, essentially reimburse people who saw the movie and didn't like it, but somehow that deal ended up being five dollars. So essentially, if you wrote a letter to Sony and you were like, hey, I hated this movie, they would give you five dollars. Uh, I'm not sure how well that went. I think probably people uh, didn't take advantage of that, but an interesting moment in film review history because this was when we were, in a sense, just starting to catch on to uh, the way that movie theaters or movie studios have always done this kind of thing. So, um, the one major thing that I want to do is talk about the two main characters, because both of them are based on real men. Um, and to be fair, they're sort of like amalgamations of real men, especially Benjamin Martin. Um, but the way that they are portrayed is very vital to, again, our historical perspective. So Mel Gibson uh, plays Benjamin Martin, and he is a very like archetypal hero. Um, I don't know, you guys have probably talked about this, especially in the core 100s, uh, when you talked about like the nature of the individual or like the nature of the hero. And he is a great example of what we think that, that should look like. Um, he's hyper-masculine in the sense that he's, you know, physically active and handsome and sexual, but he's also like a tender father. So he's got that sort of like mix of this like masculinity and femininity that we tend to value in American society. So he's a really good hero because he's got a dark past, like for sure, he can throw down, but he's, you know, sort of come around. He's like changed his mind about war and he doesn't want to go back to war and he doesn't want to start a giant conflict, but he can be talked into it if he has to. And then of course, ultimately he can kill everybody single-handedly, which is very helpful. Um, so in a lot of ways, he's like a super sympathetic hero. And that's important for a story. Um, it's really important that we have a, a protagonist that we can get behind. So they made a lot of changes to his character when they created him for the film. They did a lot of things that they thought would ultimately be very helpful. Like, for instance, you probably noticed uh, that he's a widower. That's very sympathetic. Uh, we love it when a man is raising children by himself. We find that to be like powerful and brave and sort of attractive, right? Like you probably have seen people talking about like, oh, what a good father when they see a father out with the children alone. But we don't say that about mothers, right? Like if it had been a widow and had for some reason seven children, it wouldn't have been quite as sympathetic. But a widower, a man raising seven children uh, was a very sympathetic thing. Like we, we look at that and we're like, oh, look how cute that is. So in addition um, to being sympathetic for being a widower and a father, and he loves all those babies, all of them were born. Um, he was also a veteran, which is something that we really value in American society. Um, and he was also a well-spoken, like an articulate anti-war protester. And there's a very strange thing happening here. Um, in America, we, we want people to show a little bit of resistance before entering into violence. 
if that makes sense. Like, if you've ever seen two guys try to, like, fight if they're drunk outside of a bar, one of them is always like, come at me, bro, and the other one's like, come at me, bro, because you're not supposed to start the fight, right? Like, this is a very critical thing in American masculinity. It's okay if you hit back, but you're not supposed to throw the first punch. Like, you probably remember being told this, perhaps, in elementary school. Um, so we like someone who is able to keep up, but we don't like someone who's aggressive. So it was vital for the protagonist of the story that he did not start the ship, right? So he wouldn't be sympathetic if he had just like walked up to the British, uh, you know, army colonel and just been like, like, we don't, we don't care for that. Like, we don't like the guy that just starts the fight. But the fact that he had to be pushed into it, you know, with like the death of his own child, like it was all very sympathetic. So they had to set up the movie in such a way that his unbelievable hand-to-hand -hand violence was in some way acceptable. Um, that it was like understandable that it was something that we we could imagine a person doing because if they had opened with that weird tomahawk thing that would have been Just fucked up right like it's, it's kind of weird So they had to make it an excusable act of violence That's very very important and one of the things that we'll see in all of our war movies is that the hero has to act in an excusable way you cannot start with violence you must be pushed into violence in a way that is completely unavoidable like that's one of our like sort of key things so um, he is a perfect protagonist. Uh, you know, he's hyper-masculine and yet also sort of soft. He only acts when he's forced to. He's really eloquent. So he's like a, a, a great protagonist for an American film. So he was based on a really interesting dude um, whose name was Francis Marion. So in theory, he was based on several different men, and to be sure, he probably was. Um, but the main person upon whom he was based uh, was Francis Marion, who was call, called the Swamp Fox. Uh, which I, I kind of dig. I think it's a great nickname. Uh, sometimes I'm jealous of people with cool nicknames. So the Swamp Fox um, was a, a man who lived in South Carolina, and he was definitely a real dude. And if you've ever been to that part of South Carolina, you've probably seen a lot of things named after him. Um, there's uh, Francis Marion College. Uh, there's several high schools that are named after him. There's like some parks. Uh, Marion County is named for him. So he was a very powerful um, landowner and a plantation owner. But uh, it will not shock you to learn that he was problematic. So he was a known serial rapist, um, especially of his own slaves, and he was also a known serial murderer. Um, he was involved in the Cherokee Wars and like the French and Indian Wars, but also he liked to literally hunt humans for sport, which is problematic to, to phrase it perhaps lightly. Um, so he was like definitively like a shitty dude, uh, looking back on it. But again, historical perspectives. So I wanted to show you um, a couple of the quotes that, that people use when they talk about him, especially when they're trying to reckon with his actions. Um, so one of the, oh, and actually hold on, let me tell you this and then I'll go back. So um, this is a quote from Michael Graham, who was a radio host, um, and he was doing an interview for the National Review. And the National Review is a traditionally a really conservative newspaper, or it used to be a newspaper. I guess nobody makes like paper papers anymore. Um, but if you're interested in looking at several different perspectives on current national events, the National Review is one of the ones that typically highlights the conservative far right. Um, so it's a good example of like one that's... Um, I just realized my hands are on the left. I don't know what you're looking at. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a good example of, of what people are saying on the far right. So when Michael Graham was talking um, about Francis Marion, he, in a sense, acknowledged a lot of the things that were negative about Francis Marion. He says, was he a slave owner? Yes. Was he a determined and dangerous warrior? Yes. Did he commit acts in an 18th century war that we would consider atrocious in the current world of peace and political correctness? As another American film hero might say, you're damn right. That's what made him a hero 200 years ago and today. So this is a, a perfect example of perspective. Um, this is a man who's saying that, yes, looking back, it was wrong to hunt people for sport, but at the time it wasn't wrong. Which is fascinating. Because one could argue, yes, it was. <laughs> like, it's always been wrong uh, to hunt unarmed people for sport. Like, I don't care what year it was and what part of the swamp you were in. Like, we can pretty definitively say that was wrong. Like every single religion says that was wrong. Every single like philosophy says that was wrong. But when we look back at someone doing it in history, it's very tempting to say to ourselves like, yeah, well, that was the time. It's yeah. kind of like when uh, Christopher Columbus gets brought up, they're like, oh yeah, you know, of course he, you know, raped and enslaved and all that. But everyone did that. It's like, well, he was actually so bad that the Spanish court like fucking held tribunals. Like, <laughs> the, like he was really, really bad. Yeah, like even at the time, people were like, ooh, 
like maybe let's not, uh, you know, and I think Princess Mary is a great example of that as well. So to, to look at somebody and say, did he commit acts that we would consider atrocious is a bizarre way to say that in fact they weren't atrocious. And bear in mind that what he's talking about here um, is, is outright murder of non-white people. And that's going to continue to be important. Um, as you may have noticed, if you've been watching the news, it continues to be important. We consider that to be a slightly different crime for reasons that are complex. Um, but I, I wanted to show you this because it's, it's a really interesting way of trying to sort of sanitize our history and trying to look back at someone who was objectively a bad dude and still create a bubble of forgiveness around him. So this next quote is really kind of similar. Um, this is from a professor of American history, um, and this guy works at the University of Alabama, which may have something to do with this. And he says, Marion deserves to be remembered as one of the heroes of the war for independence. Francis Marion was a man of the times. He owned slaves, he fought, in a, he fought in a brutal campaign against the Cherokee Indians. Marion's experience in the French and Indian War prepared him for a more admirable service. <coughs> so, I'm oh, sorry, I have a very bad dog. <coughs> So basically what he's saying is kind of the same idea, that he was a man of his times, that like it was unavoidable that he would own slaves, it was unavoidable that he would kill the natives. And so this is a very slightly softer version. This is a way of sort of looking back and saying, yes, well, at the time, that was very normal. And there's sometimes that we do that sort of thing. Like when we talk about um, like ancient methods of, of medical care, like when we think about like letting blood, which is something we used to believe that if, if you were sick, what you needed was less blood in your body, which whatever. But that was the times, right? Like we didn't do that specifically to harm people. This is a really interesting example of trying to place someone in their historical context to be sure, and yet also forgiving things that were wrong. So the reason that we want to forgive Francis Marion so badly um, has to do with his military strategy. So one of the things that uh, is really important when we talk about historical perspectives, and one of the things that I think I've said before that we're going to really address in this class, is that there's really no absolutes. Um, there is no one thing that is black and white. Uh, there are no people who are inherently good or bad. There are no wars that are inherently good or bad. And that's a very difficult concept um, because it's so much like cleaner and nicer and easier if people are just good or evil, if things are, are black and white. Um, but one of the hard truths that you have to really, I think, adjust to as an adult is that there is nothing like that. Everything is gray. There's only ever gray. So there are things that we can look at and distinctly say like, yeah, that is bad. But in general, a human is composed of more than one part, and a war is certainly composed of more than one part. Similarly, a country is composed of lots of parts. So it's, it's crucial that we be able to look at the bad parts and say, like, yep, that was bad, but also to acknowledge that sometimes the good parts are there, too, and that they are good. So I'm not saying that everything is equally good and bad. Certainly not. But an important part of critical thought is being able to look at someone who is objectively a shitty person and say, yeah, but he did do one thing that was cool. <laughs> so with Francis Marion, the thing that he did that was cool was the, well, not the invention, but the implementation of guerrilla warfare. So he was one of the first people to say, hey, y'all, what if we didn't stand in lines wearing red and white and facing each other and then take turns shooting? Because at the time, that was how we did war. Uh, basically, you know, and muskets were their own problem. But basically, you lined up shoulder to shoulder with your people. Uh, they lined up shoulder to shoulder facing you. And you sort of took turns. Um, it was called volleys. You sort of took turns shooting, shooting at each other. And it was very honorable. And it was very predictable. And that was how everybody had done war for a couple of decades. But Francis Marion was one of the first people to be like, yeah, but what if um, we didn't? And to be fair, he was right. That's a dumb way to fight. So he was one of the first people to say, like, what if we hid behind trees? What if we wore camouflage clothing? Uh, what if we snuck up on them? Um, and it was a really interesting war tactic because in a sense, it was dishonorable because war had always been fought the way that war was fought. But on the other hand, you've probably heard this phrase, all is fair in love and war, which Shakespeare didn't say, by the way, but whatever. Um, he was one of the first people to sort of test that axiom, to sort of be like, yeah, but if we're at war, isn't the point to win? So that's what he did. He, he won. He came up with strategies that nobody had seen before. Uh, he snuck around in the swamp. One of the major pieces of knowledge that he had that they put in the movie uh, was how to take like deer trails um, and, and like foot trails. And so basically he could move himself and his troops through literal swamps where the British army needed roads. So he was able to hide, he was able to sneak, he was able to navigate in a way that the British army just didn't anticipate. So in that sense, he was 
very much vital to the war effort. He was very much vital uh, to the freedom of America. He was vital to our history. Um, is he a great patriot? I'm gonna go ahead and say no, but was he a great military strategist? Yes. And so again, one of the things that's really complicated about acknowledging American history and our role in like world history is that, yeah, it gets fuzzy in there. Uh, there there's dark and light. So our boy, the Swamp Fox, um, did some things that were deeply helpful and that we're very grateful for. But at the same time, uh, you know, maybe not all of it. So this is the memorial that's there on his grave in Marion County. Um, so while, while he was at war um, with, with the rebel forces, essentially, his slaves burned down his plantation and joined the British Army and evacuated to England. And I kind of don't blame them, right? Like he, he was, again, a, a notoriously bad slave owner. It's hard to say if there's a good slave owner, right? But he was definitely on the bad side. Um, and so his slaves, you know, straight up hated him. And so they burned down his house uh, and defected. And then when he got home, he was like, oh shit, my plantation. So he borrowed some money, uh, bought some more slaves, uh, married his own cousin, which again, was normal at the time, um, and went on to a pretty distinguished career as a state senator. So he's, he's, again, an epitomal example of the things that we remember and the things that we forget and the things that we are willing to forgive. So he, uh, let's see, he's buried there. Oh, he's under Lake Marion. Well, that's a problem. But if you'd like to go visit, uh, his, his plantation, like the remains of his plantation are still there and his grave is still there. So if we could go on field trips, this might be one of the ones that we went to. Um, so that is Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox. All right. So let's talk about my favorite character. Um, so this is Colonel William Tevington, and he is clearly the antagonist, and he's such a good antagonist. Um, and to be fair, I just also love this actor. Uh, this is Jason Isaacs, and you might remember him as uh, Lucius Malfoy in the Harry Potter series. He's got a real mean face, uh, and he gets to play the villain kind of a lot. He's great at sneering. Um, and he is British, so that part was accurate. So he was an excellent antagonist. He's everything that we hate. He's violent for no clear reason. He's excessively violent. Um, he harms people who are weaker than him, children, slaves, dogs, people who are already injured. Um, he has zero remorse. Like even after he kills somebody, he doesn't seem to feel like bad about it. And usually if a protagonist kills someone, we try to indicate that they have some remorse. But if an antagonist kills someone, we try to indicate that they have no remorse. So essentially he's a, he's a perfect antagonist. Um, you know, he's hateful and he's mean. Um, and even the other antagonists try to rein him in, right? Like there's that famous scene where he's talking to the general, I think. Um, and the general is like, hey, you gotta chill. Like, Yes, we're at war, but you are being unnecessarily violent, uh, which is a great scene because basically they're indicating, yes, he's an antagonist. Yes, we're all antagonists, but isn't he the worst? You know, like it's, it's, a, it's, it's perfect. He's my favorite. Um, but William Tavington, also based on a real person. So this is, again, a great sort of like historical perspective. So this is the real dude. His name was Benastre Tarleton, which I don't know why people aren't named Benastre anymore, but like, let's bring that back. Um, so he was a really interesting dude too. So basically he was born um, as a, you know, a wealthy man who's the son of a merchant. And when his father died, he got his inheritance and he just like blew it all on, on women, which I guess means prostitutes, but maybe like kept women um, and gambling and drinking. So basically he, he came into a bunch of money when he was like 20 and just blew it all on like women and drinking and drugs. Uh, and then he was like, oh shit, I'm poor. So he joined the British army. And he joined the cavalry because the way that people joined the army at the time, you could essentially pay a fee to like jump up the ranks. So you would, you would buy your commission. So he, because he was, he was so wealthy and because he was a, an excellent horseman, joined at a pretty high rank and he joined the cavalry. So the cavalry is the branch that um, has horses. We don't have much cavalry anymore. But at the time, it was like a major, you know, boon in warfare. So he joined the cavalry. Um, and he came to America and he fought in several American, you know, battles while he was here. And then he went back home and became a relatively respected member of parliament. Um, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But the question here is whether he is actually the worst. So what had happened was um, there was this battle. And actually, I'm going to show that part to you first. The Battle of Waxhaws. Um, so in... America, we call it the Battle of Waxhaws. In England, they call it the Waxhaws Massacre, which should indicate, again, a perspective issue. 
And there's two different stories about what happened here. And one story is based on the sort of collective memory of the people at the time, uh, specifically the American army. And the other is based on the journal of um, an, an army medic, uh, and, which was found relatively recently. So in the first version, um, they were fighting, 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 and the Continental Army was surrendering because they were having a pretty rough time and they realized that they were going to lose. But as the Continental Army was surrendering, um, a, a stray shot hit General Charlton's horse and his horse went down. And so basically the Loyalist Army, the British, thought that the Confederates, or sorry, that the Continental Army was still fighting. So basically the the colonial army was surrendering, but then he accidentally got shot. And because they thought that they were faking it, that they were pretending to surrender while still fighting, they got pissed. So the British army massacred the colonial army. That story won. That's the story that is actually recorded in a diary that was written later that day by um, one of the doctors. The other story um, is that they were, they were fighting, 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 and early on, his horse got hit, and he went down hard and hit his head and passed out, and so the British Army thought that they, he had been killed, and they were so pissed that they killed all of the, all of the colonial army. So either way, it was for sure a massacre in which the British Army killed most of the colon, uh, colonial army, but the question is whether he committed a war crime. And the understanding at the time was that he did commit a war crime, that he, quote, offered no quarter. So offering quarter is when if somebody surrenders, you accept their surrender and you take them as prisoners of war. You do not kill them and you do not harm them. This is one of the like ethics of war thing. So technically, if the other side surrenders, you are supposed to offer quarter. You are supposed to take them as prisoners of war and like, you know, you don't treat them nicely necessarily, but you keep them safe. You don't kill them. And what the colonial army said was that he did not offer quarter, therefore he was a war criminal, and it became like a battle cry. Like as they went into battles, uh, you know, immediately following this one, and really all the way through the end of the war, they would be like, you know, while we're doing this, we're doing this because he didn't give us quarter. And it was like a helpful thing. It was great to have this enemy. It was great to be like, yeah, you know who we hate? That guy, because he did something wrong. You know, like there's there's nothing more powerful than righteous indignation. Uh, so the question is is definitely whether he did that. In books uh, that have been written relatively recently, um, they said this, and I just thought it was so beautiful. He was described as cold-hearted, vindictive, and utterly ruthless. He wrote his name in letters of blood all across the history of the war in the South. That's powerful, yeah. Wrote his name in letters of blood. It's good shit. Uh, did he? Hmm, maybe not. But it's a great example of we need a villain. Uh, and his, our historical perspective on this guy was that he did do that. And so he served as uh, like a, a grounding point, like a, like a rallying cry. He was called the Butcher and Bloody Ben, which is a pretty good nickname. It's no Swamp Fox, but I like the alliteration. Um, so he was like a, a really crucial character in terms of pointing out how bad the British people were. So, the British people uh, don't believe the story at all. This is part of why they thought that the movie was kind of libelous, because they said uh, that Charlton didn't do anything like this, um, that he's not a war criminal, that he was just a dude who was in charge of the army and, in fact, did a good job killing the enemy, which is technically your job. Um, so he went back home and made a huge success of himself. Uh, he kind of cleaned up his act, but not really. This woman over here is actually probably the most interesting person in the whole story. Um, basically, he ran with kind of a rough crowd. Um, and he was friends with a guy um, who was dating this woman. Dating is the wrong word. She was a kept woman. And he made a bet with this guy that he could seduce her. And then he did seduce her. And then they were together for 15 years. Um, and when he entered parliament, she's the one that wrote all his speeches. She was a famous stage actress and an author. She was a feminist author. She, again, she's the coolest person here. Um, and she was like kind of a fashion plate. Like there's a lot of paintings of her. And so basically, uh, you know, he seduced her on a bed and they got together and she like really helped him rise to power. And she was like a really good political hostess and that kind of thing. But then eventually her health uh, went into decline for reasons that are unclear, but I'm gonna go ahead and say syphilis. Um, and he just left her penniless Charlton. Sucked to be a woman at the time. So basically, was he a villain? I don't know, maybe not. But we needed a villain. We needed to be able to point to somebody and be like, this is why we do all the murder. It's because this guy is the worst. Yeah, very helpful. Gotta have a villain. Okay. So the next massive villainous thing that was so exciting was when they burned that church with all the people inside. So just to be clear, no, 
never happened. Um, there was definitely never a church burning that we know of, and there was certainly never a church burning with all the people inside, not on American soil. There's a possibility that such a thing happened in a war in France a couple decades prior to this, uh, but this was certainly not something that happened in America. So my question to you, uh, even though I know you're all mic'd, but I'd like for you to pipe up on this part, why do you think this is so sympathetic? Like, what do you think is like the combination of factors here that makes this the worst thing ever? Um, it's a holy place. Um, it's a lot of old, you know, women and men and children. Um, yeah. I think it's because they didn't really deserve it. They hadn't really done anything that we would consider particularly bad enough to warrant that. And that's a pretty awful way to die anyway, no matter what they did. Sure. Aren't churches supposed to be like a neutral spot where if you're not fighting, you can be safe there? <laughs> yes. And do you recall where you learned that? I have no idea. In her class. Oh, yes. Really? Well, That's yes. But from, cool. you, you guys all, you guys all learned this. Um, so this in, in core 201, you probably had to read St. Augustine. Remember? St. Augustine? No, probably not. Okay. It was, it was pretty dull. But um, basically what happened was when the Visigoths were sacking Rome in 410, uh, one of the things that they decided was that if you went into a church, specifically a Christian church, that they couldn't mess with you inside the church. And it was called taking sanctuary. Um, and so historically, that's definitely been true. Historically, if there is a war or really anything else going on, so long as you go inside a church, you are supposed to be left alone. Um, and people have, have used this for ill, to be sure. Uh, people, when they were hiding from the police uh, or from conquistadors, used to go into, into churches and hide there, even though technically they were guilty. But the rule is, you have to be given sanctuary. If you've heard the phrase sanctuary cities, it's kind of the same idea. Basically, if you go inside a church, you're off limits. Core. You learned that already. It was in your brain. You had it. I know. Um, anybody else on, on the church burning? Uh, I also think because Gabriel just married, I forgot her name, but the girl that was in there, and then that made him mad, but he got killed. True. But yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, that was a very, like, sympathetic set of characters. Like, they had just gotten married. They were about to, like, start their life together. It kind of reminds me of how the church across from, uh, what's the name of that plaza outside the White House? Oh, that Episcopal church, St. John's. Yes, I thought it was St. John's. That reminds me of how when Trump used the Secret Service to escort him to St. John's and took a photo. Didn't let, the, didn't let the priest know, so they, they actually kicked out the priest from the church. Yeah, that's also a thing that happened. Yeah. That was a whole weird thing, man. I didn't realize until yesterday, I finally saw a clip that he really did have the Bible upside down and backwards. It was a weird moment. Uh, but yeah, that's a great example, because typically going to a church is a good way of like expressing Christianity. It's a good way of expressing like your alliance uh, with Christianity and with Christian people. Um, and so having this happen in a church was definitely symbolic in that regard for sure, for sure. So yeah, I think you guys are hitting on all of it. Uh, that's why I think this is such a, it's a, like a perfect um, impetus, you know, for, for action. Number one, absolutely, it's a church. We don't fuck with churches. Number two, it was innocent people inside the church. We're not supposed to do that for sure. Uh, number three, it was women and children. Uh, and generally speaking, again, in warfare, we do not mess with women and children. Um, so it was like a maelstrom, right? Like it was, it was, it was all the bad things sort of switched together. So again, in regard to storytelling, genius, uh, in regard to history, and it's a hard note. So I love that scene. Oh, wait, sorry, what? You know how in the movie they would kill a lot of the women and children just so? They really do that? Well, I'm not saying that didn't uh, happen, but typically in warfare at the time, not, not nearly as much. There have certainly been wars in which that was considered standard practice, but that wasn't something that was standard among the British at the time. Um, you certainly didn't shoot children. That was a weird one. Good question. Okay, the church. So let's talk about how evil the British dudes are. Um, so this is kind of also my favorite. So. One of the things that um, a couple of you brought up in your, in your papers and in your response post was this idea of you're kind of curious about how the British teach about the Revolutionary War. Um, because for instance, when this movie came out, they were really mad. They were like, we are not like this. Like we didn't do these things, you know, which is fair. But somebody had to be the villain, especially if the story is meant to glorify one side. 
right? Like almost nobody makes a war movie where no one is the villain. Um, some people do, and those movies are amazing. But for this movie specifically, uh, it had to be like highlighted how bad the British were. So interestingly, they didn't do it based on the stuff that we were actually mad at the British about. Um, they didn't talk about taxation. They didn't talk about representation. Uh, they didn't talk about uh, being ruled by somebody who's several thousand miles away and doesn't even know you. Like they didn't focus on the stuff that the Revolutionary War was about. They just outright focused on like villains. And so one of the things that people talk about when they talk about this, uh, this movie was that it was directed by a German. Um, and so a lot of people think that he tried to sort of superimpose Nazi values on the British characters. And I'm not 100 on that argument, like I think it's kind of interesting, but I'm not totally sure. Um, so I'm curious if you all think that it's possible to have any sympathy for them. Like at any point, did you think to yourself, maybe it's not their fault? Um, I do think they made some efforts, like obviously the colonel and general were just unequivocally horrible people, but I think there were some points where it's like, these guys are surrendering, they're just like some random dudes, you know, in the army. They don't deserve to be like hit with a machete 85,000 times. Okay, well again, that's fair. We'll keep talking about this as we work through the semester. Um, but this idea, you know, that, that the American soldiers were all good and the British soldiers were all bad um, is, is clearly impossible, right? Like one of the things that we find, um, and one of the things that you may find as you do your interview paper specifically, is that very often when people go to war, they go um, to get paid. So sometimes people go to war because they really like fundamentally believe in the cause, but very often uh, the people who end up actually fighting in the army are men who don't really have any other means of income. Um, so a lot of people tended to join the army, the British army and definitely the, the colonial army, uh, because they got fed uh, and because they got land afterwards if they did a good job and because they got some clothes, you know. So I think it's kind of an interesting idea that all of these people are specifically very evil. Um, but they did do a great job painting them as super evil. Imagine having to ride on a boat for three months with a bunch of horses just to fight a war you don't care about. Sounds terrible. So, um, this is from a film critic who is actually really mad about the way that the British were portrayed. So I thought it was interesting, again, because it provides us a new sort of perspective. Um, so he said, any image of the American Revolution which represents you Brits as Nazis and us as gentlefolk is almost certainly wrong. And I think that's, again, a really sort of an interesting idea, because he argues it was a very bitter war, a total war, and that is something that I'm afraid has been lost to history. The presence of the loyalists who did not want to join the fight for the independence uh, meant that the War of Independence was a, co a conflict of complex loyalties. So this is one of the things that should be popping up in your book a little bit, this idea that, in fact, not everybody even wanted this war. Uh, it, was, it was pretty unpopular at the time. So the idea that all of the colonists were like, yeah, is itself inaccurate, you know, because everybody was still British. One of the things that we talked about yesterday was this idea that um, the colonists did still consider themselves to be British. They still were, you know, they, they didn't think of themselves as inherently a different breed of humans, you know, than the British people. So for a lot of these soldiers, they were just British people fighting British people. And it was, in a sense, almost a civil war. Um, because to be sure, the colonies were trying to become their own country. But at the time, it really was British on British, you know. So this, this pictorial, or this, this display of them um, being like obvious bitter enemies is, is really inaccurate. Although again, had to be done for film purposes. I also wanted to talk about this phrase, total war. Um, so what does total war mean? What do you think? I think it's like where they require everyone to be a part of the war or like almost everyone's involved in some way or affected by the war. Yeah, perfect, yeah. So very often we divide you know, war into kind of two categories. And so there's like, there's war, 
where you know the men are all fighting each other somewhere like in a field and then there's total war which is like oh they're in the backyard um and it involves you know everybody who was around so the the revolution and really the civil war too were very much total wars in the sense that you couldn't stay out of it because they were outside they were bleeding on your porch they were digging up all your squash like they were stealing all your cows like it was it was very personal to all of the people who lived there so total war has a lot to do with number one who all is involved um and number two also brutality um typically in war you are supposed to leave people alone you know who aren't involved um but in a total war it's kind of considered a free-for-all it's basically it's us versus them and them is everybody um, so in that regard, it was different than a lot of the other wars we think about. Like by the time we get to World War One, for instance, not a total war. That's mostly just some dudes in trenches in France, uh, you know, to an extent. But this war, um, like actually, I think several of you talked about in your papers having gone to battle sites um, and, and to the extent that the battle sites might have been like two miles from your house. So if you can imagine, for these people, the battle site was two miles from their house. So in that regard, it was it was a very conflicted war. Um, so again, that's something that should be coming up in your book. Um, the flip side of this is the idea that the colonial army was made up entirely of heroes. Look at them, they're so brave with their little blue coats. I, I like army uniforms, I think they're really interesting. Um, so again, one of the things that I think we very often forget about the Revolutionary War was that essentially these were a bunch of traitors. Uh, they were looting, they were destroying property, they were defecting, uh, they were going against the sort of unstated oath that comes with being born somewhere and being a citizen of that place. Like we look back and we think, oh, look at these these revolutionists, look at these fighters, look at these Americans. But it's important to remember that at the time they were just a bunch of like upstarts uh, who sort of came out of nowhere and were fighting for something that a lot of people thought they didn't deserve. So the the way that they're portrayed in this film is of course uh, noble and powerful and good, but it's important to remember that, of course, they weren't. Um, a lot of them were mercenary soldiers, which is to say that they didn't give any, you know, fucks what was going on. They just wanted to get paid. Um, there were some black soldiers. So one of the things that happened in the movie um, that was technically accurate um, was the fact that you could send your slave instead of yourself. And this will be true in the Civil War as well. Um, so technically, if there's a conscription at the time and you owned a slave and you didn't want to go, you could send that slave. Uh, because what they really wanted was a body. They didn't care if it was your body. And at this time, that was also relatively common. So if you didn't want to join the army, you could send uh, you know, somebody in your stead. And very often it was a slave. Sometimes it was just a random poor recent immigrant. Um, so the people that made up the army were not necessarily like patriots. Like a lot of them uh, were just getting paid to be there. So that part, I think, is something that we forget as well. Um, there was like a, a trade-off for freedom. So the, the, the British Army did offer that if uh, a Black American who was, again, a slave, they were all slaves at that point, uh, there were some freedmen in the movie, but that was fake, we'll talk about it. Um, if, a, if, a, if a slave wanted to defect and fight for the British Army, um, typically if they fought for one year, then at the end of that year, they were free. And a lot of them, if they fought for the British Army, could go back to England, and that's what a lot of people did. So that part was kind of true. There were definitely black soldiers fighting, but for the most part, the people, the black soldiers who were fighting for the colonial army were slaves who were like kind of being forced to be there, and the black people who were fighting for the British army were on their way to becoming freed men. Um, so the way that they portrayed it in the movie was a little bit like fuzzy and happy uh, in a way that was inaccurate. Speaking of which, what? So this is one of the parts uh, that people had a lot of problem with. So there's the scene in the movie where uh, the, the British Army comes and they're trying to talk to these men and the men are like, but we're freed men and we love Mel Gibson and we're happy here. And it just, uh, one could free their slaves uh, if they so chose, but it was not something that was really regularly done. It was an, it just incredibly, incredibly rare, and it certainly wasn't done by Francis Marion. Um, so this idea that, that, you know, the main protagonist had a bunch of freed slaves who were for some reason still all delighted to be there and work for him is, you know, just, just some movie bullshit. Um, and this turned out to be kind of a problem for a lot of modern audiences. So for instance, this is Spike Lee, um, who you're probably familiar with as a film director. And he says, uh, for three hours, the Patriot dodged around, skittered about, or completely ignored slavery. 
which is true. Uh, the Patriot is pure blatant American Hollywood propaganda, a complete whitewashing of history. So my question to you then, this class, um, why do you think they did this? What do you think is going on here? Well, I mean, most people, you know, if you own slaves, you kind of become an irredeemable protagonist. And they made it very clear that they still wanted, you know, Mel Gibson to be the good guy and, you know, the British to be the bad guy. So, you know, more about, I guess, what's entertaining and what fits a story arc than actual history. I think that's basically right. Anybody else? Did this bother anybody? Did this stick out to you, this, this scene specifically? I was just kind of confused by the scene, so like I was emotionally torn with like how to feel about it, if that makes sense. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I thought it was a weird one. It was a very weird one. And I think you're right that that's one of the things that we really struggle with, um, you know, with the founding fathers, who were all slave owners, to be sure. Um, and on the one hand, yeah, that was normal at the time. And on the other hand, that doesn't mean that it was good. You know, so this is, I think, a, a sort of a great example of, of why we whitewashed that part of history, because we needed that character to be a 100% good guy. Like, he needed to be an unassailable protagonist, um, a violent, hatchet-wielding protagonist. Uh, but this is kind of a, a, a key example, like this scene is a great example of literally changing a historical perspective, like literally changing that narrative in such a way that it benefits people in modern times. So this is one of the things that we talked about, um, I think in the first lecture of the semester, this idea that sometimes we change the historical narrative, um, sometimes to benefit the people who are, who are alive at the time and sometimes to benefit the modern audience. So in this regard, it, you could argue it was a little bit of both, like we needed Francis Marion to not be the worst, uh, but also they, I think, probably just felt like the audiences didn't want to see that. Um, and kind of we don't, right? Like movies that really honestly address slavery tend to be less popular in the box office, um, but it is still an inaccurate portrayal of history. And, and in that regard, um, I think it's important that we address that it is inaccurate. So that is the end of the slideshow. So I'm curious to hear from y'all uh, what your experience was like watching this movie. Did you yell at the TV? Did you watch with other people? For me, I was like, I was kind of torn because on one hand, it's cheesy, but it's entertaining. You know, it's nice to watch something that can be just entertaining, even if it's dumb and cheesy and predictable. But on the other hand, it's like, yeah, that, that didn't happen. Come on now. Like there's, you know, that was like, part of me was like, this is entertaining. And part of me was like, I kind of feel bad that I'm enjoying this because I know that it's just mm -hmm. bullshit. Yeah. My favorite part was when Mel Gibson walked up to the fort that um, the Colonel was in and he said that he had slave, he had, no, he had a uh, prisoners of war and uh in order to free the american colonists that were fighting he used the dummies up on the hillside that was a good part i wonder if anybody did that in real life i didn't see anything about it that was kind of cool it's clever i liked it when he stole the dogs i appreciate I like it when we know that guerrilla warfare is like a little bit of a strategy as well because i feel like a lot of times when you think about that, it's just like people going crazy, but this kind of showed a different perspective and how it was actually a strategic way of fighting. Yeah, I'm glad they addressed that, because again, to be fair, that was super important. We'd probably still be British without it. Well, it might be German, but that's all another story. Sorry, Miss Hemming, what were you going to say? Oh, bringing up the dogs. I liked when I realized what their names were, and I'm just like, wow, he really just named them after Ares and Zeus, huh? Oh, that's who they were? I wasn't yep. paying attention. Uh, it was, I think it was Jupiter it was the Roman versions. and Mars. Yeah, it was Roman versions. And I'm just like, oh, wow, they did that. So. Hmm. Oh, I wrote down some notes that I wanted to tell you. Um, number one, that scene where um, Heath Ledger is getting like sewn into a little sack to spend the night next to the woman he's courting. Um, that's real. So that was called bundling. And basically, since everybody lives so far apart, it was really hard to court properly because, you know, it took you 
half the day to ride over there and half the day to come back. So it was a historical practice that you could stay in the bed with the person that you were courting, but you would generally both be sewn up into little blankets so that you couldn't escape and have sex. Um, so you would stay there all night, and then in the morning the parents would come and like unbundle you, and you could get back out and go to your house. Pretty weird, huh? I've always wanted to try it. Be like in a sleeping bag. Um, <laughs> oh, the other thing was muskets. So um, we have a couple people in class who are actually really interested in uh, like the mechanics of military warfare, but I wanted to be clear about um, how inaccurate muskets are. So they've done a lot of research lately, um, especially with like the bullet holes in, in trees at, at Revolutionary War sites. And it turns out that muskets are actually much worse uh, than you think. So we think that on average, the American soldier specifically hit about 2% of the shots that they were aiming for. Yeah, that really bothered me. I'm just like, okay, what well, they're just gonna actually hit what they're shooting at? Every time, from a distance. <laughs> And to be fair, also like ten year olds. <laughs> um, to be fair, it's not because the Americans were bad at shooting or the the, the colonial army. Um, they were unusually good, uh, in large part because they used them for hunting. So they had been like trained on these on these muskets, and they did pretty good training in their war camps. Um, the British were thought to have hit even less than two percent. Um, so basically, one of the reasons that they like lined up facing each other was because that was the only way they were going to hit anybody. Um, and again, to be fair, muskets are the worst. Uh, there's a whole lot of inaccuracies in the barrel, and each little uh, musket ball is is shaped differently. Like, remember all those scenes where he's mel melting down the toy soldiers to make the, the balls? Um, so each one of those is shaped a little bit differently. So every time you shoot a weird-shaped ball out of a weird-shaped tunnel, it's gonna, who even knows, it's gonna go somewhere. Um, so the, the inaccuracy of the weapons at the time was a major part of warfare then. Has anybody ever shot a musket? I've always wanted to try. No, it's never come up in my life. Um, I think that's almost all I have for you. Any other thoughts on the movie? Was it like the millionth time some of you have seen it? Well, it's always been one of my favorites. But now that we're analyzing it so in depth, it's like, what was I thinking? Maybe I don't like it all that much. That's a hard thing, right? Like, it's, it's inaccurate, but that doesn't mean that it's not very visually stunning. And the score is amazing. Like, it's, it's, it can be kind of hard. Like, I watch a lot of garbage television. Uh, and I think as long as you acknowledge that you're watching garbage television, it's okay. <laughs> you know? They can't all be masterpieces of accuracy. Uh, well, Tiger King was very accurate, I think. But it certainly is garbage. I think the one thing about accuracy that, you know, kind of makes the movie like a little suspicious is like, if the only inaccuracy is like, oh, they hit every shot, like, okay, that's, you know, they don't understand the efficacy of muskets, whatever. But, oh, they said that there really weren't slaves, like, okay, that, you have to go out of your way to do that, <laughs> you know, that isn't just something born out of ignorance, you know, everyone knows that slaves were a thing there. So that's kind of like, it's one thing to be inaccurate where it's just like a minor trite details but the other words like that in my opinion yeah that's a fair point because nobody wants to watch a movie where everybody misses 98 percent of the time <laughs> that would be so tall. maybe that maybe he did do that hatchet six hour uh, movie <laughs> their frustration would have been real though mm, true imagine how frustrating that would be you shoot and shoot take a shoot. drink every time they miss a shot your liver you have liver failure in the first intermission you would all die um, this is, I, I think, I'll be really interested, especially after this, to, to hear what you guys think about the Civil War movie, uh, about Gone with the Land, because there's a lot of similar inaccuracies. Um, like, there's parts that were inaccurate, like, nobody had that dress, but there's parts that were inaccurate, like, slaves weren't happy. You know what I mean? Like, so, you, so you're right, there's like a sort of a scale of inaccuracies that we're prepared to handle. It's kind of like, um, I think it won Best Picture or something about the Green Book, I watched that with my parents and then I looked it up and it's, it's so screwed up because they didn't tell the family they were making the movie. And then when the family found out, they're like, hey, this is all wrong. Can you like change it or not? And then they just ignored him, you know? Also the director of that film like said the N word like multiple times. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So this isn't just an old movies thing. That's a fair point. Yeah, every time we make a historical movie, we tend to, Whitewash it a little.
That's why I think fantasy adventures are the outright best. That's right. There's no dragon angry about their portrayal that I know of. So, any pressing questions before we meet tomorrow to discuss all our feelings? Okay, okay. I'm, I'm really, there's a lot of things that I have written down to talk about tomorrow, because uh, your papers have been so interesting, um, especially in regard to how you feel about your knowledge. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious about that. So, I think that's it for today. I guess I'll see you all tomorrow in smaller groups. We'll have such good talks. Um, and other than that, just let me uh, know if you have any questions, and I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, Dr. B. Oh, Mr. Barroso, did you want me to stay so we could talk about your paper? Yes. Okay. Let me stop recording. <laughs>